All right, let's take a look at conservation biology. What is it? It's a scientific discipline devoted to understanding the factors, forces, and processes that influence the loss, protection, and restoration of biological diversity within and among ecosystems. That is a mouthful, so let's summarize it like this. It is applied and goal-oriented. Conservation biologists intend to prevent extinction. That's the goal. This discipline arose in recent decades as biologists grew alarmed at the degradation of natural systems they had spent their lives studying. Many biologists began studying life in the 50s. By the 60s and 70s and 80s, they realized, oh my gosh, there's massive extinction going on here. We need to do something. There's a famous theory in conservation biology called the equilibrium theory of island biogeography. There are many theories, but this is one of the most relevant, one of the most uh, prominent ones. So we're going to take a look at it. So there you had an island, a mangrove island. And this theory helps explain how species diversity patterns arise on islands as a result of immigration, new species coming into the islands, extinction, ones becoming extinct, island size, how that matters, and distance from the mainland, how that matters. The theory originally developed as basic science for oceanic islands. Then it was found to apply to islands of habitat, meaning fragments within terrestrial systems for conservation biology. In other words, when you have terrestrial systems and due to development, that forest, for example, was becoming fragmented where only parts of the forest were left. This theory also seemed to apply. All right, don't get too carried away with these graphs here. I'm gonna help you through this and it's actually pretty simple. Immigration rates so here's the theory. Immigration rates are highest for islands with few species. The fewer species are there, the easier it is for new ones to come in. Extinction rates are highest for islands with many species. The more species there are, the greater the rate of extinction. So at some point, there's a balance between these two factors, where as the number of species on the island increases, immigration drops. As the number of species on the island increases, extinction increases. So there's going to be a point where these cross, and that's the equilibrium number of species on that island. So what kind of things affect this equilibrium number? One of them is, well, two things, size of the island and distance from the mainland. So immigration rates are highest on large islands. It's a big target, easy for new species to find. And extinction rates are highest on small islands because the populations are smaller. The smaller the population, the fewer individuals you need to lose before that population can successfully reproduce and it dies out. Let's not even take a look at this for a moment because I think it's just going to confuse us. But together, these two factors mean that large islands have a larger number of species because more immigration and less extinction. So you get, um, it's called the area effect. You get a gray, uh, you get a larger number of species at equilibrium. Let's take a look at the next part here. Immigration rates are highest for islands near the mainland. The closer to the island, the easier it is to get to it, the greater the immigration rate. The extinction rates are not affected. So this one is not changing. But greater immigration for nearer means this is going to be further to the right than this other one. So the point where they cross is further to the right, meaning greater number of species on the island that is nearer. So bottom line, together this means islands near the mainland have a larger number of species at equilibrium. This is called the distance effect. And um, there's actually data that supports the idea that the larger the island, the more species it will have. This is data from Caribbean islands, um, Redondo, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Jamaica. As the size of the island increases, the number of species on the island also increases. So greater species richness for greater size of island. The summary of this theory is very simple. The larger the island, the more species it has because there's less extinction and larger populations. The closer the island to the mainland, the more species it has also, because there's more migration to it, because it's closer. So here's an island. There was a study to see if this theory actually proves true. And uh, they tested this 
on small mangrove islands in the Florida Keys. And they found, they did something kind of interesting here, all the arthropods type of insect were extinguished from them using some kind of insecticide or pesticide. And then the researchers observed as species returned to the islands. Equilibrium numbers matched their predictions supporting the theory. Uh, excuse me, is there an open bathroom anywhere? Okay, pardon the interruption. Land studies also show historical declines in mammals in national parks. So here we see what may have been formerly a continuous forested area, possibly, is now fragmented areas of, um, of national parks. So these are basically land islands, and we get the similar effect. So the smaller the park, the more species have declined. And this is consistent with the parks acting as land islands. So this is a good time to take a look at fragmentation, where you have an original habitat, but through development, clearing um, for timber or housing, you get gaps forming. And uh, you can still see that this whole part is still continuous here, but as you begin to clear more, now you have smaller continuous parts becoming more fragmented until you have just a few islands left. This is very bad. This this leads to local extirpations of forest species as fragments become too small to support them and too distant to allow immigration. And um, what we really want, ideally, is to maintain at least some continuity. So maybe if these were all four touching each other, if they were the same area, that would still be better than having four smaller areas that were separated. Because here you might have a certain species of, you know, um, uh, some kind of a squirrel species or something where the population might be just too small to survive but if it had the area of these four touching then it might be able to survive more easily. So what are some conservation approaches? I mean we looked at the problems how can we prevent these? Dealing with endangered species we can try to preserve single species threatened with the extinction um, by using laws and they often also achieve umbrella conservation. So what do we mean by this here? Well, by umbrella, we'll, we'll get to that point actually in a little bit here. The U.S. Endangered Species Act in 1973 is one of the most famous laws put into place to help try to conserve species. It restricts actions that would allow, that would destroy endangered species or their, habit, or their habitats, and it forbids trade in products from species. It prevents extinction, stabilizes, and recovers populations So who has it benefited? It's had notable success with the bald eagles, the peregrine falcons, and 40% of all declining populations have become, have held stable. So it's been keeping those endangered populations, about half of them at least, from declining further. However, many citizens believe it will restrict their freedom if endangered species are found on their land. So, so there's sort of a policy of uh, you know, bury it and shut up. If you uh, if you find an endangered species on your land, tough tough luck because good luck trying to get any any permitting to develop that land. If you bought some uh, some new land and you wanted to build a house on it, and they said, "Sorry, you can't. This is an area that's a, that contains a protected endangered species," then um, you're gonna have a lot of walls ahead of you as you try to develop it. But Habitat conversation, Conservation Plans, Safe Harbor Agreements, and Canada's Species at Risk Act promote cooperation with landowners. So you might be able to do some kind of a land swap or something like that. Captive breeding is also done. Many endangered species are being bred in zoos to boost populations and reintroduce them into the wild. This is true of the condors. Um, it has worked so far for them. And here you can see a condor puppet, hand puppet feeding the chicks. So it imprints on the birds, not humans. But this is worthless if there's not adequate habitat left in the wild. The, um, the condor population got down very low and got down below 100. At some point, I believe it was even in the, like, around below, like, in the, basically in, in the 20s. Uh, and then it ended up, oh, yeah, it dipped down to, to 22. And then um, 100 were born in captivity, or actually 250 were Okay, right, let's get this straight. There was the population dipped to 22, 
and they were taken in from the wild and they were bred in captivity. And then of 250 of those bred in captivity, 100 have been re-released. So it has worked to a large degree for them. There is a concept called umbrella species. When habitat is preserved to meet the needs of an umbrella species, it helps preserve habitat for many other species. Those primary species serve as an umbrella for others. And what might be an example for an umbrella species? Large species with large home ranges like tigers and other top predators are good umbrella species. If you protect a given um, habitat to try to give tigers that large roaming area they need, all the other species that live within that region are also going to be are also going to be protected and benefited. And there's also a term flagship species, which are charismatic species that win public affection, like the panda bear. The idea here is that by trying to protect one species, you also are protecting other species. And also international treaties. Various treaties have helped conserve biota. A major one that you need to know is CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, prepared in 1973. It bans international trade and transport of body parts and endangered organisms, such as elephant tusks and things of that nature. Also, um, this is just uh, an FYI, I'm not going to quiz you on this one, but there's also a Convention on Biological Diversity, which is more recent, 1992, and it aims to conserve biodiversity, to use biodiversity sustainably, and to ensure a fair distribution of its benefits. It was signed by 188 nations, but not by the U.S. All right, now this is a big concept that you do need to know, biodiversity hotspots, an area that supports an especially high number of species, meaning maybe more than 1,500, endemic to the area, meaning found nowhere else in the world and experiencing severe habitat loss. Here we see an endangered golden lion tamarind endemic to Brazil's Atlantic rainforest, which has been almost totally destroyed. If you take a look, at, look at the worldwide map, this, these areas in red are global um, biodiversity hotspots, where 50% of world plant species and 42% of terrestrial vertebrate species are known to exist. So many of these areas are along the coast, as you can see. So in conclusion of the, all these three parts, we've seen that erosion of biodiversity threatens to cause a sixth mass extinction. Biodiversity loss results from habitat alteration, invasive species, pollution, and overharvesting, and climate change, which we'll discuss more. Human society could not function without biodiversity's benefits. We call these environmental services. And conservation biology holds promise to slow the erosion of biodiversity to help curb species extinction. All right, scholars, so I would like you to make sure that you take a look at the associated pages of your book from these, um, from these videos and make sure that you complete the Cornell notes. I would expect to see um, two sides completed, and you should also be um, writing a three to four, three to five sentence paragraph summary of the main ideas that you are remembering from this um, introduction. Okay, we'll see you in class. Thanks for tuning in.